Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. How's everybody this morning? This is Russ and Kitty and Jennifer with Morning Light Bible Study. This is where you study your Bible, chapter by chapter. You get your whole Bible back. We started in Genesis several years ago and doing a Monday through Friday with a little downtime for vacations and road trips and ministry. We are all the way to Song of Solomon, and we're in chapter 3 today. And we're excited because this is one of our favorite books of the Bible where we learn who the truly the beloved is, who our bridegroom is, and who's the bride. Of course, we say that about every book of the Bible. <laughs> we love them all. <laughs> Funny somebody one time, they uh, realized that it was okay to... Uh, underline in their Bible, and they <laughs> underlined the entire Gospel of Matthew. They said they just didn't know uh, where to stop because oh, it was all good. Oh, that's sweet, huh? So today, that. we're studying in the Song of Solomon, chapter 3, The Bride Seeks the Bridegroom. Song of Solomon 3 describes the quest of the bride seeking out her beloved. Now, just who, who is the bride anyway? Is the bride Israel? Many people believe so. Uh, and they believe so to the exclusion of the body of Christ. They believe that, you, that the church cannot be both the body of Christ and the bride of Christ. We're going to clear up that confusion today. Uh, the, it is a common belief that the bride is Israel and also, it's common to believe that the bride is the church. But did you know that in your soul, as an individual, you are, a, as a member of the bride of Christ, that means who Jesus is to the church is also who he is to you. Amen. You are the body of Christ in your human spirit, where God lives, and the bride of Christ in your soul, in your mind, will, and emotions. Let me say that again. You are the body of Christ in your human spirit. You are the body of Christ. I'm sorry. Let me say it again. <laughs> One more time. <laughs> you are the body of Christ in your human spirit where God lives. And you are the bride of Christ in your soul, mind, will, and emotions. There's a difference between your human spirit and your human soul. Your human spirit is the body of Christ. Your human soul is the bride of Christ. We're going to talk more about that to help you understand the difference. In this chapter, the bride seeks the bridegroom in her own bed. And what is a bed? It's a place of rest. Now, she cannot find him. She seeks her beloved in her bed, and she cannot find him. Now, what, what you don't know, without thinking about it, remember when Isaac met Rebecca? Mm -hmm. It said he took her into his mother's tent and she became his wife. And and in, when you study ancient cultures, and particularly Solomon, uh, Solomon had, uh, what was it, 400 wives and 900 concubines? Something like that. And this is a man <laughs> who's the wisest man in all the earth. Uh, we won't have that conversation. And uh, so uh, when you study how... As a king, he would relate to the women in his life, his bride, his brides. Uh, <laughs> his primary wife was an Egyptian princess that he built a palace for. And that was her own singular home. And when it came time for them to be together, Solomon did not go to her house. She came to his house. Mm. In ancient cultures... Uh, even in Bedouin culture, you study Abraham and Sarah. Sarah had her tent, and Abraham had his tent. And when they were, and it came time for them to come together in that way, the bride always went to the bridegroom's tent, not the other way around. Mm -hmm. So when someone in an ancient culture read this, they instantly saw something amiss. In this first verse. Because of course they would say to the bride. Of course you didn't find him in your bed. You have to go to his bed. And so it's saying something to us about rest. 
There is the rest that we would take, the rest of man, and then there is the rest of God, but they are two entirely different things. Mm. And uh, it's like Romans says, don't say in your heart the righteousness which is of faith. Does not say, let us ascend up into heaven to bring Christ down, mm -hmm. or descend down into the earth to bring Christ up. But it says the word of faith is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart, in your spirit. Where do you find the bridegroom? In his habitation. Mm -hmm. And I've had the Lord say to me many times, and I've prophesied it to people, I'm not coming down to you. You're going to have to come up here to me. I'm not coming down to you. I've already done that. Amen. Didn't he do it? As though God is sitting on the throne and Jesus is sitting on the throne and we're offended that he has distanced himself from us and he's at the right hand of the Father, far above all principalities and powers, and we're down here in the muck and the mire of our experience, and we get frustrated because we feel like he's not where we are. <laughs> but it's like Jesus said, he said of the 12, now you really need to get this. We're actually wrapping our June conference around this concept. When Jesus called the 12, it said it was ordained, he ordained the 12 that they should be with him. Amen. I remember the young man I've had a vision in my heart for God to give us a young couple that we could train to move in ministry as we move in ministry, that one day they would carry on what Father's Heart Ministry does in the spirit and tone and temper that God has given it to us. And uh, there's been three or four couples that we've, we've brought on board, but they proved themselves unworthy. Not that I would have rejected them, but their attitude was this. Okay, I got this. Uh, tell me what my compensation package is, and now I'm going to bring my vision on board in Father's Heart Ministry. No, they didn't get it. They didn't understand what was going on. And the last one we dealt with, he got frustrated one day. He says, you don't have enough time for me. I said, uh, it's not about you. And I quoted in the scripture that Jesus ordained the 12 to be with him, not the other way around. And that's mm -hmm. exactly what I want you to see in this verse. She starts out looking for him in her bed. In other words, Jesus, I want you to come to me on my terms mm -hmm. so that I don't even have to sully my feet mm -hmm. to get out of this place of rest that I'm in. I want you to come on my terms. And, oh, no, you have to go to him. And there's a process involved, and we're going to talk about that. See, she goes out in the streets. You're going to find that in this chapter, she realizes she's not going to find the bridegroom in her bed. So she goes out into the streets and she doesn't find him there either. But she does find the watchman. And we're going to talk about who the watchmen are. And they point her to where he may be found. Mm -hmm. See, all true leaders in the body of Christ do not point to themselves, Amen. but to him. But yet, haven't I grown up even in evangelical, fundamentalist, charismatic, Pentecostal Christianity, and I've heard preachers being in the ministry, I've been, I'm a third generation minister, and I've been around scores of ministers uh, that have pastored many, many churches affecting thousands of lives. And I continually have heard them as a young man talking about the fact that, in a sense, they were married to the church. I beg your pardon. Nowhere in the scripture do you find the idea of being married to the church. The leader is one who espouses the church as the bride unto Christ. Likewise, you have... People who believe, and you find this commonly among women, uh, they believe they're married to Jesus. And I remember there was a lady in the, the second church I pastored. And she had an anointing, had a call on her life. And uh, she sat down with me, and she had given 10 years of her life, feeling like she was married to Jesus. And she sat down to ratify that decision again. And she wanted me to sanction the fact that she was married to Jesus. Well, first of all, she was under 60 years of age, and Paul said that women under the age of 60 years are commanded to get married lest they wax wanton against Christ. She thought not getting married was going to uh, cause her to be more, have a deeper fidelity to Christ, but according to the Bible, that women under 60 years of age 
who uh, try to think of themselves in that way are actually doing exactly the opposite. And so she wants me to sign off on her being married to Jesus. I said, I've just got one problem with that. If you're married to Jesus, that, as far as I'm concerned, that makes you the boss's wife. And that's not going to work in this church. And it wasn't too long after that, she blew up the whole church and took about a third of them with her because I would not sanction her as being the boss's wife. She manifested. I mean, we're just talking now, right? See, as a prophet, I get to give you all that back channel communications. Right, because you pastored. You know, a lot of times <laughs> as a pastor, you don't talk about that kind of stuff. It's like, no, we don't talk about that. Sisters, no, we don't talk about that. Brothers, no, we don't talk about that. But as a prophet, Moses said he spake unto the people according to all that God put in his heart. I get to give you the unvarnished truth. Do you want me to talk to you like a child or do you want me to talk to you like an adult? I've had a lot of people answer that question and say they want me to talk to them like an adult, but what they do next proves that they were very, very childish. Mm -hmm. So let's begin reading. In case you hadn't noticed, I've had my helpers out there. If you'll turn around and look, they've brought out the snorkel gear and the scuba equipment. You check with your dive buddy. <laughs> check your tanks. Days, huh? It's going to be one of those days that Yay. we're going to talk about some things that go just a little bit deeper, perhaps, than what you might have uh, expected. Those of you that are old hands, you know what this is all about. <laughs> Song of Solomon. Read the entire chapter, please. Oh, okay. Chapter 3. By night on my bed I sought him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets and in the broadways. I will seek him whom my soul loveth. I sought him, but I found him not. The watchmen that go by the city found me, to whom I said, Saw ye him whom my soul loveth? It was but a little that I passed from them, but I found him whom my soul loveth. I held him, and I would not let him go, until he had brought until I had brought him into my mother's house and into the chamber of her that conceived me. I charge you, O ye daughters of Jerusalem, by the rows and by the hinds of the field, that ye stir not up nor awaken my love till he pleases. Who is this that cometh out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the powders of the merchant? Behold his bed, which is Solomon's. Three score valiant men are about it of the valiant of Israel. They all hold swords, being expert in war. Every man hath a sword upon his thigh because of fear in the night. King Solomon made himself a chariot of the wood of Lebanon. He made the pillars thereof of silver and the bottom thereof of gold and the covering of it of purple the midst thereof being paved with love for the daughters of Jerusalem. Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon, with the crown wherewith his mother crowned him in the day of his espousals, with an S, in the day of the gladness of his heart. And that was at the very last verse. It says, Go forth, O ye daughters of Zion, and behold King Solomon. I submit to you this, if you're not one of the daughters of Zion, you're not going to behold Jesus your king. You know, oh, I want to see him. I want to press into his presence. You know who gets to behold him? The daughters of Zion. And we've taught you in the past. What is Zion? It's the parched place. <laughs> People go, oh, I just want to see you, Lord. And the Lord looks at the angel assigned to your life. They really do want to see me. So you march them out into that parched place. And God marches you out into a parched place. And all of a sudden, God, why is it so dry? Why am I so dry in myself? Because Zion means the parched place. Let's go up to Zion. We sing that song all the time. And we dance and we shout. And, oh, aren't we happy? But we don't understand. God put me in a parched place. Put me in a place of hiddenness, not in manifestation. Because it's only in the place of hiddenness that your heart burns within you. And he illuminates himself to you as he did to the two on the road to Emmaus. Are you a daughter of the parched place? I'm not talking about just the ladies. The daughter he's speaking of is your soul. See, in chapter 3 now... We find the, the bride seeking the one she loves, but she finds him not. Now, remember that in the Song of Solomon, the bride is the church collectively and your soul individually. And I want to drill down on that. If in your soul, you are the bride of Christ, betrothed to him. In other words, the bride of Christ is a corporate or collective bride as a whole. 
And we individually make up the bride of Christ, con constituting the idea of marriage as a metaphor for the union with Christ that we enjoy in our hearts, specifically the soul part of our makeup. Now, what is the difference between being the body of Christ and being the bride of Christ? Because again, people say, well, you can't be both. Yes, you can. See, are we the body of Christ or are we the bride of Christ? The next time somebody asks you that, you say, yes. yes. <laughs> because you're both. See, when you ask Jesus into your heart, and it's not because it's just a twin metaphor talking about the same thing. It's not talking about the same thing. There is a difference between the bride and the body, and we're going to delineate that for you. See, when you ask Jesus into your heart, your human spirit, my father is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I and my father are one. Mm -hmm which means Jesus was speaking out of his spirit, not out of his soul. That's why he always referred to his soul in the third person. Now is my soul troubled exceedingly nigh unto death. His soul was external to who he perceived himself to be. So just as your body is the house for your soul, even so your spirit is the habitation of Christ by faith. Your body is external to your soul, even as the person of Christ in your spirit uh, is external. The spirit of Christ is external to your human spirit, but he resides on the inside of you. He looks out of your human spirit the way our soul looks out of our body because he is in you. Amen. He resides in your human spirit. He inhabits your human spirit, causing you to be one with the father because he's one with the father and when he moves into your human spirit now he's not living in your soul or haven't you noticed that yet <laughs> hello <laughs> we wouldn't have so much trouble he was <laughs> see he resides in your human spirit inhabiting your human spirit and because he's one with the father you're one with the father now think about your spirit immediately adjacent to your human spirit is your soul. If you could see the anatomy of your inner man, you would see, just like you see your human heart in the center of your chest, you would see your spirit at the center of your person and then immediately adjacent to that in the cavity, if you will, the cavity adjacent to that would be your soul. And your soul is made up of mind, will, and emotions. And so you would see your spirit and your soul and the first part of the closest your soul the, the component of your soul that's closest to your human spirit is your emotions. That's why Paul told the Athenians when he declared the unknown God to them, he said, even you pagans are feeling after him. We're all feeling after mm -hmm. him because your emotions are the closest thing to your human spirit. And mm -hmm. he speaks to you from your spirit and you register it in your emotions and then your head, which comes next, talks you out of it. Mm -hmm. But then around that, the membrane of the, between the soul and the body is your volition. It's your, it's your will. That's why the power of your will is so determinant in what happens next in your external circumstance. Mm -hmm. So he resides in your human spirit, causing you to be one with the Father. Immediately adjacent to your human spirit is your soul. Have you ever heard anybody talk about this? I've never heard anybody teach this stuff, but it's so plain in the scriptures. Your soul is wrapped around your human spirit, just like the body is wrapped around your soul, your mind, will, and emotions. Therefore, your spirit, as somebody says, I got to go listen to this again. Well, you can <laughs> get it in writing if you go to the website uh, tomorrow or go to our Facebook page. It's already posted out there. Go to eChurch on Facebook and you'll see the teaching posted there. Your spirit as God's habitation. Now listen, your spirit God is in your spirit the way your soul is in your body. So your spirit is to God what your body is to your soul. So in your spirit, you are the body of Christ, but in your soul, you are the bride of Christ. Amen. See, part of the work of Christ in coming to earth was for Jesus as God to inhabit a human body and offer it up on the cross in order to make himself a many-membered body to dwell in. Now, let's give some scripture for this. I'm going to read Hebrews 10, 5, 7, and 9. 
Wherefore, when he comes into the world, he said, now it's Jesus talking to the Father. He says, Father, sacrifice an offering you would not, but a body that has prepared me. He prepared a body in the womb of Mary when the Holy Ghost came over her and overshadowed her, and a body was conceived, prepared for Jesus to be born in and walk in the earth, the singular body of Christ. A body you have prepared. And then in verse 7 it said, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. He had to have a body to do the will of God on the earth. Why? Because God gave man dominion. Amen. God cannot penetrate the earth unless he first does so through the willingness of a man. That's why he could not send his son to die until he first got Abraham to offer up his son. Mm-hmm. So he says, look, see, he got a man to give him everything. And he says, that's it. We've got the permission slip now because we gave them authority to subdue. We gave them dominion over all the earth. And I got a man to give to me what I fully wanted to give to humanity. And so I have the receipt and the legal authority according to the laws I set up in creation to now give to man everything that I have to give. Amen. It's beautiful. See, that's why the will is the outer membrane between your soul and your body. Nothing can happen. The kingdom of God is within you, but without the cooperation of your will, what's on the inside of you will never penetrate your life and bring you to breakthrough until your will is brought into conformity. Mm-hmm. All authority is given unto you in the earth. And it's only, that's why you pray, not my will, but thine be done. That's why we, we submit our will. Say, Lord, I'm willing to be willing. But he said, lo, I come in the volume of the book to do thy will because he had to have a body. And then he said, in verse 9, lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He takes away the first, the first what? The first body on the cross. And then he took it up to heaven. I took away the first that he might establish the second. The second what? The second body of Christ. Mm. Which is who you and I are in our human spirit. So we are then the body of Christ in our human spirits, but we are the bride of Christ in our soul. When God made man's soul, now listen, when God made man's soul, he did not create an automaton or a living mannequin, if you will, to live in. Because if he had, he'd have still been alone. If he'd have made man without a will, if he had not made allowed something in man to be made manifest that was individual from himself, then he would be just simply uh, um, carrying about a cosmic puppet show. Mm-hmm. You understand that? He had to, in creation, to somehow give man an individuation, if I can use that word. Is that a word? It is An individuality independent of himself. How is he going to do that when he's God? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to tell you that. (laughs) See, in order to marry your soul, he in some way had to make your soul something other than himself. This is why we read in creation that God did not directly create the soul. And I've touched on this on occasion in our teachings. Read with me the following. What do you mean God did not create the soul? Well, open your Bible. Because you're not going to believe it unless you see it in your iPod. Genesis 2, 7. And the Lord formed man of the dust of the ground, his body, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And that word breath of life is the same word for the Spirit of God elsewhere in the, in the Old Testament. That's why Job said, as long as my breath is in me, the Spirit of God in my nostrils. Mm-hmm. See, man cannot create life in a test tube. He can only manipulate life that already exists. They tell we've created life. No, you didn't. You just simply took something that was already alive and you manipulated it. Mm-hmm. Because man's life is created by the extension of God's uncreated life into him called the breathing into that body to cause that body to animate. See, that's your human spirit. It's an extension of God himself, which is why Paul said 
in Acts 17 to the men on Mars Hill who were pagans. He said, we are all his offspring. What does that mean? We are all springing out of him. That's why he said in him we live and move and have our being. That's not evangelical doctrine, but God is not an evangelical. That's right. And evangelicals quote Acts 17 and say Paul was in error there. Mm -mm. But I beg to differ with them. No. So he breathed in his, he took, he made the body, he breathed into that body the breath of life, the Ruach of God. And what happened? Man became something, a living soul. Do you see that that tells you that the soul is the product of the breath of God coming into that dust body? That tells us that it is the byproduct of God breathing into that body. God did not directly create the soul. The soul sprang into manifestation when God put his breath into that body. Why would he do that? Is that just an accident of nature? No, he was doing something. He's after a bride and he can't marry himself. I know you've probably met some married people that would have been better to be single because they're more in love with themselves than they are with their spouse. Somebody just elbowed their spouse. Uh, the soul was not directly created by God, but rather it sprang into being when God put something of himself called the breath of life in the physical body he fashioned from the earth. In this way, he has in your soul something uniquely external to himself to betroth himself to as the eternal son to a bride prepared for him from the foundation of the world. Therefore, again, we see that you are the body of Christ in particular. In your spirit, you are the body of Christ. And in your soul, you are the bride of Christ. In that sense, your soul is feminine, spiritually speaking, in relationship to Christ. That's why Peter, in referring to the human spirit of a woman, in 1 Peter 3, 4, and you ladies really need to go look that verse up and read it. He talks about your human spirit as the hidden man of the heart. He didn't say, look at a woman and say the hidden woman of your heart. Because you are not a woman in your spirit. You are a man in your spirit. Because that's where God lives. Who is that man? That man, if you could, that man that you are in your spirit, if you could see him in his totality, he is the man, Christ Jesus. <laughs> in your human spirit, indwelled by God, neither male nor female in status in terms of a natural perspective, but in our relationship to Christ in our soul, he is also the bridegroom and we are the bride. Now think about it. Think about your spirit and your soul. Your body is the bedroom. Your spirit and your soul are twin beds. Hmm. And here we have, at the beginning of our chapter, we have the bride. She's in her bed. This is Rob and Laura Petrie, okay? <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What's the name of that show? Uh, Dick, Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke. Rob and Laura Petrie. They, it twin was, beds. The, the censors would not allow them to share a bed together, so they had to have twin beds. And how many know if they were really uh, man and wife, they would have been pushing them beds together occasionally. Uh, but think of your body as the bedroom and you've got these twin beds there's his bed which is your human spirit where he dwells and then there's your bed is your human soul and she wakes up and she's trying to find him in the soul realm and she can't find him there and he's laying over there on his side saying come here baby <laughs> <laughs> to let there be a commiseration that let your soul ascend let your soul migrate in itself to the spirit that you might become one with him. I speak a great mystery, Paul said. I speak concerning Christ and the church. church. Yeah, amen. Wow. Who's with me now? Wow, huh, Lakeisha? <laughs> <laughs> in verse 1, what's that? How, aren't you just splitting hairs, Brother Walden? Why do you think the enemy has worked so hard to destroy the family Souls, unit? Yeah. Why do you think he's worked so hard to destroy marriages? Did you know that atheists have a lower divorce rate than evangelical Christians? Mm -hmm. I wonder why that is. 
The enemy of your soul doesn't want you to get this. He wants this to be a foreign concept, just like father. You say father to the majority of people in the younger generations, and they look at you and scratch their heads because they either had no father or the father they did have was not a good one. No connection. Not true for all of them, but true for many. So verse 1, we see that the bride, and we're just getting started here. <laughs> now you need to email somebody and say, you really do need to listen to this today. In verse 1, the bride seeks the bridegroom in her own place of rest on her side of the bed, and she finds him not. Now what's the problem? See, because that's the soul. What puts the soul at rest? See, the rest of man... You put man at rest, you're talking about a state of half-heartedness. How can we say this? By letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Now, she's looking for him, but she cannot find him. What's the problem? Now, how many of you, where is God in all this? Brother Walden, pray for me. I can't find God. I can help you if you can stand it. <laughs> Let and, Scripture... And, and remember you asked. Yeah, I can answer that question, but remember you asked. Because I never answer a question I had first been asked. Amen. Brother Walden's got a lot of things to say. My daddy said a preacher's got something to say about everything. I've learned to keep my mouth shut. But there's one thing that I will say. You want straight forth truth from Brother Walden? Ask the question. Amen. It's like God told Kitty one time, I have the answer. What's a question? <laughs> See, let scripture interpret scripture. I can't find God. Where is God in all of this? And we say that as though it's God's fault. But Jeremiah 29, 13, let the word be the discerner of what? Soul and spirit, bride and bridegroom. Mm -hmm. Come on. Jeremiah 29, 13, you shall seek me and you shall find me when you shall search for me with all of your heart. And if you're not finding him, what does Jeremiah, what is the commentary of Jeremiah 29, 13? That's not true, Brother Walden. I am seeking him with all my heart. Well, well I have a choice. I'm either going to believe what God's word says, or I'm going to believe what you think, or what I think about myself. Mm -hmm. See, that's the beauty of the word of God. It is such a sovereign discerner. If you can't find God, Jeremiah 29, 13 levels an indictment against your heart. And are you capable of correction? Most people today are incapable of correction. Name the last time you saw a Christian. See, we repent to become Christians, and then we repent because we hate repenting so much, we think after we become a Christian, we don't have to repent anymore. And people exchange their repentance, their capacity to repent, for the capacity to have an opinion. And as you cannot have an opinion and have a spirit of repentance. Mm -hmm. And when's the last time you, as a believer, deeply, transitively, and absolutely made a 100% course change in your life? That cost you dearly and deeply, having once become a believer. Very, very few. See, not being able to find God, according to Jeremiah 29, 13, it's a, now, you know Russ loves you, right? We know, Papa. And people that know me know that the very last thing I'm motivated to do is to correct you. We have some little strutting little Napoleons that call themselves prophets are out there stalking the aisles just waiting to see who they're going to pounce on and run through the meat grinder of their so-called anointing. That is not who Russ and Kitty are. However, the scripture is there to give us a stark, are you, are you capable of a stark and transparent image of yourself looking into the mirror of God's word. Not being able to find God is a heart issue. Looking around you, where is God in all of this? See, when we ask that question, the implied challenge is that it's up to God to clear up your misunderstanding. It's not. I can't find God like that's his responsibility. Nothing could be further from the truth. Through the lens, if you look at that struggle through the lens of Jeremiah 29, 13, when you cannot find God, it's an indictment 
of your own heart's condition that you must address lest you be in danger of your soul. So the question is, you can't find him in your bed. That means you've got to get out of your bed and you have to do something. Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come with observation. Amen. Pursue him. And look, I've got people, I've had people email me. Uh, uh, I can't listen to Morning Light anymore. Because... They just say they just can't live it. They can't handle it. They can't take what they hear because <laughs> it challenges them. And they don't see themselves as someone who can respond to the mandates that these teachings are bringing out. But all we're doing, folks, is saying what Jesus said. The kingdom doesn't come with observation. If it doesn't come with observation, that means you have to do something. Yeah. See, observing, what it, when you're observing, you're in the bride's bed. She's in her bed, she's, she's reclining, she's relaxing, she's perfumed herself, and she can't find her bridegroom. She has to get up and get out of her bed. Mm -hmm. You have to come up and get out of the place of rest, the place of putting it in neutral. And unfortunately, all of Christian culture is geared to set you in a place of neutrality. Born again, baptized and branded, get in that sheep shed, sit in that pew, be there three times a week, deposit your tithe check, and as long as you do that, you're going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. What happens when you coast in your car or put it in neutral? If you uh, have a little bit of an angle, you are rolling backwards. It's an automatic reaction. So the bride in her bed is akin to a person who sits back in the seat of self-appointed authority and expects God to meet them on the terms of their own incredulity and prove himself to them. That's sitting in the seat of the scornful. You cannot say in yourself, in effect, go ahead and impress me, God, I dare you. Many people do this in the prophetic. People come in the prophetic, they refuse to believe the prophet unless they conduct themselves like a psychic or a clairvoyant. In other words, if the prophet will speak to me in such a way that requires no faith to believe, then they'll accept him as a valid prophet. They say to the prophet, tell me my social security number and I'll believe. They'll say, oh, that's God. Is it God or is it just an idol of unbelief? As the Shulamite in her bed in verse 1, you will never find God in that dysfunctional manner. You will not find him in your bed or the place of human rest or passivity, but in his bed in the rest of God. So when he said, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. What was he really saying? It was a bridegroom saying, I don't want that in my bed. Come on now. Because you just want what's in it for you. That's right. Heaven help mm. us, you and me. Mm. He has prepared... He has a bed of rest that he has prepared, but it's not the rest of unbelief demanding to be satisfied, but in the place of faith's expectation, knowing that the cross is the only satisfaction that meets the needs. We, God is not answering to us. We are answering to him. We are not asking him to descend into our circumstance and into our place of passivity, but he's demanding us to ascend into his place of participation. Amen. So <laughs> when the bride arises from her bed, now what does she do in our chapter? She arises and she goes out into the streets, into human society, trying to find her beloved. And she doesn't find him there, but she does find the watchman. Who are the watchmen? Watchmen, what of the night? These represent pastors and leaders that you will encounter when you're looking for God. If you go looking for God and you don't find a pastor or a preacher or a leader somewhere, you're not looking hard enough. So she goes out, she finally decides, I'm not going to sit here till I die. I'm not going to sit here and feel sorry for myself in the name of Jesus until the rapture takes place. I'm going to get up on my own two feet and I'm going to go find God. And she goes out into the streets and immediately she finds the watchman. Now notice that the search doesn't end with the watchman. <laughs> Just because you find a pastor or a leader does not mean you have arrived. See, they are not the way to God. 
they point the direction. Let's go a little bit deeper. And if you're a pastor, you just hang with me. Because you're going to say amen by the time you get through hearing what I'm saying. <laughs> See, just because you find a pastor or a leader, you have not arrived in your quest for intimacy with God. Verse 4 says that when it was only, now go back and look at verse 4. Only when the bride, it says when she got past the watchman. Mm -hmm. When she passed the watchman, she found the one whom her soul loved. Come on now. Now, that's the real problem for many Christians. They never get past the watchman. How do I know that? Because I talked to all you people out there that my African American sons and daughters say, I'm church hurt. That's a phrase they have. Well, what's the problem if you're church hurt? That means you can't get past your pastor. Oh, my pastor, he didn't shake my hand. He offended me. He got in trouble. He fell. And I'm just scandalized. Mm -hmm. Well, so that's just like the Shulamite. She goes and finds the watchman. And they treat her in a certain way. And she just gets discouraged. I'm just going to go home and go to bed. I'm just going to go back into my own bed. Jesus, if you want me, you're going to have to find me here. Oh, no. She had to get past the watchman. Says, I was but a little that I was passed from them. From who? The watchman that I found him whom my soul loveth. Most people do not have the motivation to look much further than their pastor. And unfortunately, there are some pastors who will hold out their arms and say, come here, baby, you have arrived. Just sit under my anointing till Jesus comes. Oh, no. See, too many believers never get past the watchman. They get born again. They get an experience with God and they find an anointed pastor or leader and their search ends there. And their whole life it is from just passing from one watchman to another. It's just one watchman handed them off to another watchman, handed them off to another watchman. And they say, well, I just wasn't getting fed. And they go to the next watchman. They're not willing to get past the watchman. They don't realize that you have to get past your pastor to truly find the one whom your soul loves. Every true pastor, every true pastor will get this. Every hireling will find you on your spiritual quest and make demonstration of their anointing. Hey, I've got the anointing. You have arrived. Look no further. Mm -hmm. Now give me your credit card number. Jesus. They then lead you back to your bed in a pew and say, just be happy. In that place of passive serving and a religious expression, and you never go on to find the rest of God where your beloved waits. Say, I've never heard it like this, Brother Walden. Chris, that's good. Spoon fed and dead. It's like dead man walking. You're right. Go read Ephesians 4, Amen. 11 through 15. Amen. It says that the watchman, notice what it says in Ephesians 4, 11 through 15, the fivefold ministry that they are appointed that you would grow up into him, Jesus. not them. Come on now. That's good preaching. It's like one of my mentors complained that he sat in a church for 20 years and they kept saying, uh, you just be faithful in your calling and we'll let you know when you're ready. Because they thought he was growing up into their standard rather than growing up into the standard of the stature of the, the glory of God in Christ Jesus. Are you with me? We're with you. We're tracking with you. Verse 4, go, and again, every true pastor gets that because as a spiritual papa, like my own uh, children, I want my kids to stand on my shoulders Amen. and excel beyond what I have done in my life. Mm -hmm. If my children, at the end of my days, I look at my children and I see they have not excelled me in every avenue of life, I will feel in those areas that they have not excelled, I will feel in some way a failure. And the same way with my spiritual children. I want my spiritual children, my kids. You say, well, who are your spiritual children, Brother Walden? The ones standing on my shoulders. Amen. <laughs> Reaching for Jesus. The ones that are following me around saying, Daddy, 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 like Enoch did. Mm -hmm. God, Daddy, Daddy, Daddy. He haunted God. Them mm -hmm. folks that just won't go away. <laughs> 
Daddy, daddy, daddy. And one day God picked Enoch up and says, why don't you just come home with me? That's who your spiritual children are. They're the ones that will not go. I told Kitty in the beginning, she said, do you think we should start having meetings? I said, no. I said, we will know it's time for us to begin ministering to people when like little puppies, we will kick them and they won't go away. When we tell them you have to go somewhere else. No, we won't do that. And finally they said, look, we know where you live and you can pretend you're not home, but we're coming to your house and we're not leaving till you teach us. Thank and Father's God. Heart Ministry was born. It was the birth. <laughs> See, the pressure in our ministry is not to keep all the people in, but to manage the people that are already <laughs> here. And global. <laughs> <laughs> On a global scale. Thank you. So, so verse 4 goes on to say that the bride, finally she finds the bridegroom, the bride finds the bridegroom, and it says she would not let him go. She got past the pastors and the leaders and found her. In other words, that's talk, remember what I've said to you over and again about living this life on your own recognizance? Yeah. That's what I'm saying to you. You need to get past your pastor. You need to get past your leader. You need to get past that and just begin to trust and have your own independent walk with God, where you go from being a constituent of your leader to being a peer of your leader, and maybe like Barnabas and Paul, being the mentor of your leader one day. Barnabas didn't like that very much, and they got in a fight. Mm -hmm. See? It happens. See, she got past the pastors and the leaders, and she found a relationship with her bridegroom that no delegated representative to good give her. You know, it, when it comes to the marriage bed, folks, two's company, three's a crowd. Hello. Hello. She laid hold upon him. People out there laying hold on your pastor. I'm not going to let you go. You better. Mm -hmm. Because he's not designed to give you, nor is he called to give you. Too many people are looking to their pastor for what they ought to be looking to the bridegroom for. Come on. That's the truth. And what you allow to come between you and God, God will remove. Yes, he will. And we get all scandalized because our pastor failed us. So is it the pastor that failed? Or is it the fact that people made him an idol and God had to expose him? So is it sin in the heart of the pastor or idolatry in the heart of the people? Come on. And then they sit back and, oh, we're just going to appoint a committee so this doesn't happen again. ha, <laughs> ha. Well, who's going to appoint the committee to deal with the spirit of harlotry and idolatry in the heart of a congregation that's looking to their pastor for what they ought to be looking to the Lord for? And unfortunately, too many insecure pastors sitting back and letting you do that because they sleep better at night whenever you have that unjust and unhealthy dependency upon them that ought to be invested in Jesus and not in their flawed humanity. Amen. That's good preaching on She found something in Christ that can be expressed, cannot be expressed in the infrastructure of, re, of religious culture. So I want to ask you the question. Have you gotten past your pastor? Mm -hmm. That pastor that hurts your feelings. Maybe you got your feelings hurt because you were looking to him for what you should have been looking to the Lord for. Have you thought about that? Have you found the watchman who doesn't point you to himself, but rather points you to Christ? Those are few and far between. And if you're one of those pastors, send me an email. I'd like to meet you. Paul was such a leader. He understood his role. Well, how dare you say that, Brother Walden? Hey, I pastored. I've been in a pastor's home my whole life. My grandfather was a pastor. I've pastored several churches. And I superintended, as a denominational official, 900 churches and their pastors. I know what of where I speak. Say, so, well, you've never pastored. Oh, yes, I have. <laughs> you know, how can you say all that? Ask me how I know. Yep. Ask me how I know all those things. It's because I've been on that territory. I've walked there. I know that territory. I've been on both sides of the equation. I've gotten it right and I've gotten it wrong. That's right. <laughs> and paid the price. See, Paul gave us the perfect picture of a leader. 2 Corinthians 11.2. He said, I am jealous over you with a godly jealousy. You ever seen a jealous pastor? 
Go tell your pastor you visited a church across town and find out what kind of response you get. Rut row. <laughs> <laughs> but Paul, listen to what Paul said. He said, I'm jealous over you with a godly jealousy because he knew the difference. Yeah. He dealt with it his entire ministry, squabbling preachers. He said, I have espoused you to one husband mm -hmm. that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. In other words, he said, I want to so deal with you that when I present you to Christ, I can accompany that with the tokens of your spiritual virginity. Mm -hmm. There it is. In other words, they have not been contaminated by looking to a human source for what only comes from you, Jesus. Mm -hmm. How many of us in our human spirits can say we can present intact the emblems of our spiritual virginity? Or have we fallen into that condition of looking to others and other things for what we ought to be looking to the Lord for? I wonder if there's 144,000 of those who look to Jesus. It talks about that. My, my. It just came up in my spirit. So make it your concern to take care that you do not look to your leaders for what you ought to look to the Lord for. The leader at best is merely one who should rightfully, as Paul, espouse you to Christ. Many people often get hurt and offended at leadership because they want the leader to become their dependency rather than looking to Jesus himself the true shepherd, the faithful pastor. See, the faithful pastor will be the pastor that espouses you in your heart and in your soul to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm. I remember as a young woman when I was um, just coming up in my 20s, how I, you know, you get this longing in yourself and you think, oh my gosh, I, I need something. I'm so bored. I, I need to go shopping. I need to and it took uh, several attempts at that for God to break through and to let me know it was him. It was him calling me and wooing me by his spirit. He is the only one who can bring us that complete satisfaction. And that's when you begin to rejoice. And that's when you begin to dance and advance because, you know, he's wooing you and drawing you. And there's no substitute for who he is and how he can fill you and instantly just satisfy you. And that's the soul that has to be given over to the bridegroom. So, Father, thank you more. Thank you big for these words of life and these words of truth. I pray that they will be, they will penetrate all the way through our soul, through our mind, through our own human will, past the emotions of life and touch and reverberate in our spirit so we won't let them go. So we ask that you would seal these words in our heart that we might not sin against thee. In Jesus' name, amen.